The following podcast is a Sempronto Media production. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. We have Missy Bain of missybain.com and she is a functional medicine practitioner and she had for years struggled with chronic constipation, joint pain, weight gain, and sleep issues. So now she has created her own plan that allows her to kind of shed the diet mindset and just feel a lot better. So welcome, Missy. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your struggle. Like what was, it's funny because, um, I would say those things are questions we get all the time, chronic constipation, Mm -hmm. joint pain, and weight gain. What are the things that you had to do in your your own life that had to get rid of that constipation, joint pain, and weight gain? Well, honestly, I had to hit rock bottom um, because up until that point, I thought it was all normal. You know, I was hearing in the world of media that as you age, things fall apart. And so at the age of, you know, 30, I thought all of these things were sort of normal and I just had to figure out how to deal with it. And then my rock bottom came in 2012 when I had a pretty bad back injury and ended up on muscle relaxers in the bed. And I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I called my husband and I said, if Amex calls, the credit card hasn't been stolen. I'm figuring this out right now. And I ordered books and shakes and plans and all these different diets and all the things. And I was like, I'm getting to the bottom of this because for years I've been going to my doctor every year for my checkup and say, I'm constipated. I do not go to the bathroom ever since I had a baby. Um, and you know, 1995 and, and he would say, Oh, try this laxative. And then he would say, well, try, you know, this type of fiber or whatever it might be. And I knew that wasn't my issue. Like, you know, intellectually, I knew there was something going on in my body. And so Once I kind of got all of the supplements and all of the things, I started making changes to my diet and just kind of lifestyle changes. And then all of a sudden things kind of reversed. And what I realized was that I was gluten and dairy sensitive. And so the muffins and the cereals that I would eat in the morning would just completely kind of clog me up. And that was just an ongoing battle for 15 years. Um, And all of that, you know, sensitivity then kind of cascaded into the joint pain, the sleep issues. And then subsequently, I know the thyroid issues that, you know, down the road, you know, up until probably a year ago, I've been kind of struggling with. So, so that's what it really took for me is just to kind of get to the point where I had to figure it out because nobody really in 2012 was talking about, you know, food sensitivities or gut health or any of the things that now I kind of, you know, deep dive into daily, really. So tell us a little bit about, I know you do some intermittent fasting. So talk about what kind of intermittent fasting schedule you do and what does a typical day look like for you? Yeah. So typically we, we tend to eat a little later, um, dinner wise. So probably I stop eating around eight at night. And then most days I I typically never eat breakfast unless I'm hungry. And then I will just honor whatever my body is telling me. But for the most part, I don't eat before noon. Um, most days I eat around two o'clock, three o'clock. Um, and then I always break my uh, fast with a shake. And that usually includes uh, a protein powder that I love, some vegetables, some fruit, a little bit of fruit, blueberries, usually, Um, you know, I throw in collagen, chia seeds, stuff like that. And that's what I always break my fast with, because what I found is when my body is primed and ready to take in nutrition, that's the way that I can really kind of just, you know, get the most nutrition in one solid, you know, meal. And sometimes I'll have, you know, I'll have a boiled egg or I'll have some leftovers or, or some vegetable, you know, like a cucumbers or I don't know, you know, if I'm still hungry, I'll munch, but otherwise I usually will wait until dinner, um, and have just a couple of meals a day. Okay. So you're starting your eating window either at eating, starting at 12 and then end at eight or starting at two and end at eight. So either a six hour eating window or eight hour winding eating window, and then you're breaking your fast with a smoothie with protein Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. kind of So that's kind of, is that your daily habits that you kind of do? That's my daily habit. Yeah. And I'm not real structured. Like I I do feel better when I go, you know, closer to 18 to 20 hours. But again, if I'm hungry or maybe I didn't sleep well the night before or I'm stressed, sometimes that will trigger me wanting to eat a little bit, 
you know, break my fast a little earlier. But for the most part, my happy place is around the 18 hour mark. Um, Me too. And yeah. and I want to really dive into this because it's, I I call it flexible intermittent fasting. And I, I get annoyed when people get so crazy about it because then they're not listening to their body. So it's not like, so for me, like, I'll give you an example. Last night, I knew we were going to have a late dinner and I never eat a late dinner. I almost always start my eating window at 12 and then I end at six. That's kind of my routine, but we weren't even going out to dinner until seven. So I knew, but you know, it was with a large group of friends and I knew like everyone's going to be late. And by the time we order, so I actually didn't start my eating window until three, knowing that I was going to have kind of a later night, but I wasn't even that hungry anyway. So it was, it just kind of worked out. But again, it's, it's very flexible. Every day is flexible and I'm really paying attention to, am I physically hungry? So talk a little bit about that, of how you are determining you know, how flexible are you? Is it, you know, I think there's, it's a balance, right? Because it's a balance between, I'm such a routine person. I do the same thing every day. That's why most days I'm at 12 to six, but I'm also very flexible. Can you talk about that fine dance that you need to do? Yeah. And I'll tell you, it was a long time coming. So if anybody listening is like, I want to get to that point, just to be patient with yourself and give yourself grace around the fact that your body can, it may take time for your body to sort of figure out what your new routine is, but it will get there. Because I will say one of the biggest things that um, intermittent fasting has done for me is the food freedom component. Like I never really thought I was an emotional eater, but then once I started intermittent fasting and really doing its extended fast, I realized how powerful it was for me emotionally to feel like I had control over the food instead of the food having control over me. And that was a really big eye opener for me. And what I tell my clients is, look, there's no fasting police that are going to knock on your door and say, you didn't do it right, girl. You're, you're kicked out of the club, you know, like you really do need to pay attention because, you know, for years I was that hangry, you know, like eat the carbs for breakfast, crash around 11, have a snack, have some carbs at lunch, crash around three, have some caffeine, you know, like I did that like roller coaster, that blood sugar insulin roller coaster for years. In fact, my family would carry around snacks with us when we would be out and about, you know, in life because they were like, oh gosh, she's going to get hangry and somebody needs to throw her a snack. And so that has been one of the most important keys for me is to really develop that metabolic flexibility um, and be able to say, you know, I feel a little lightheaded or I'm getting a little bit of a headache or, and a lot of times, honestly, that's, I haven't had the water. I haven't, you know, maybe I haven't, you know, done some electrolytes in a few days, or I just haven't really, my self-care has been a little bit off Um, because typically I feel really good until about three o'clock. And if I go to three, I just have to make sure that I get all the food in that I need, because what'll happen is after dinner, I'll find myself going, I'm a little hungry, you know, and I find myself kind of nibbling on things that I shouldn't or don't want to. Um, that might be lying around the house. So the cues that I kind of try to listen to are just really physical. And if it's emotional, I try to acknowledge it. And sometimes I'll give into it. And sometimes I'll just try to take my dog for a walk or, you know, call a girlfriend or do something that kind of takes me out of that mode of focusing on the food. Yeah, I love that. So give us some of your daily habits that you do every day that you'd say like, without fail, these things I'm doing every day. And it really keeps me kind of grounded and where I need to be. Well, I've finally gotten back into a workout routine, which had been kind of like, you know, willy nilly for a while. So some type of exercise in the morning, whether even if it's just going for a long walk, I have to at least kind of get out of my head for a little bit. As soon as I wake up, um, get grounded, um, water, tons of water first thing. Um, is always a must for me. Um, I'd like to do some type of meditation, journaling, prayer, something that kind of gets my day started on a positive note. I don't always do that. Sometimes I kind of get going and um, let that kind of slide. But really everything else, you know, my supplements are always a must. 
Um, sleep is a must. I usually try to get in bed at the latest by 11. Usually it's lights out at 1030. Um, and so, you know, otherwise I'm not a super strict, rigid, scheduled person which I need to be probably a little bit more. Um, but just as far as self-care goes, um, you know, I take a bath most nights. I have scoliosis that affects kind of my back. That as the as I've aged, um, has kind of I have to give it a little more love. So Epsom salt bath most nights is kind of in my self-care routine. Um, I try to do castor oil packs at least, you know, once a week, every couple of weeks, coffee enemas, maybe once a month. So I have a lot of stuff that I kind of like, um, come and go with throughout the month that I just kind of mentally keep an eye on or try to keep on my radar, but nothing that I'm super rigid about other than, um, you know, making sure I stay hydrated through the day. Yeah, I do a castor oil pack at least five nights a week. So oh, wow. definitely if you guys go to chantalrayway.com slash castor oil, I have some great videos on how I do the castor oil. And it, it's a little bit of a science, but the thing is, is that when you, when you look at it, I actually am probably putting, because a lot of people say, okay, put one tablespoon or two tablespoons. I'm putting like probably five to seven tablespoons, a minimum of castor oil on my stomach at least five nights a week because I do struggle with chronic constipation. So I have to, for the most part, just do way more than the average Joe. Yeah. So um, what, so first I want to hear your kind of castor oil routine. How much castor oil do you do? And then I want to hear what is kind of the biggest game changers for that chronic constipation? Um, so castor oil, I usually, I probably don't do that much, but now that you're saying that I probably should think about maybe cranking that up a little bit. Cause what does it hurt? You know, if nothing else, it's good for your skin and it's pulling out so many toxins and it can't hurt a thing. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to steal that. Um, but I usually do that in the evening after dinner, I kind of like to find a quiet place to, um, just kind of chill out. Sometimes I'll listen to music. Sometimes I'll turn on a Netflix show or sometimes I'll just read. Um, but I really, it's just a really nice way to end the day. So that's sort of the way I like to do things. Um, in fact, I love castor oil as a, you know, on my skin after my bath some days too. It takes a little while to sink in. So I don't always do that. But, um, and then for the constipation, really the game changer for me was taking gluten and dairy out. You know, I get a little cocky every now and then when things are good and I'll start to kind of, there's one place I can eat their, their gluten pizza because it's so good. Um, and it really doesn't bother me that much as long as I only do it once a month. So that's my treat. Um, but every now and then if I have too much gluten or I'm sprinkling too much feta on my salad or whatever it is, I'll pay the price for a few days. Magnesium glycinate is a go-to for me, vitamin C. Um, sometimes I'll crank that up if, I, if it's been a day or a half a day since I've um, gone to the bathroom. Um, you know, even just manipulation, just manual manipulation in that area sometimes is really good just to kind of change things up, but, or, you know, kind of get things moving. Um, but really my, my, my water first thing in the morning and then moving first thing in the morning, I feel like, because I'm not eating right away to kind of get everything going. Um, sometimes I'll do apple cider vinegar, um, if things are kind of moving slow, um, you know, but typically I can kind of manage it with just kind of different little supplements here and there, just kind of gauging on how I feel. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um, so talk to me a little bit about what are the best tips you have for sleep? So, you know, I have, it's funny because I have my aura ring on and I oh, yeah. wear it every single night and I love it, love it, love it. But what does your sleep look like? So I luckily, knock on wood, sleep has never really been an issue for me other than when we moved from the East Coast to the West Coast and back within a year. So that was pretty horrendous. But um, my husband struggles with sleep. So we've, we've done it all, tried it all. Um, but for me, whenever I have a sleep issue, if, especially if we're traveling coast to coast, melatonin works for me. I know some people do that regularly, daily. 
Um, some people say it doesn't, it doesn't work for them and really sleep and, and trying new things is just about trial and error, you know, to say that this works for me. So it will work for you. It's just like most anything, right? (laughs) It's like, we just kind of have to try it and see how our body responds. But ideally it's really sleep hygiene. It's cutting out the screens, you know, all the things that people talk about cutting out the screens, um, you know, getting in a cool environment, um, dark environment. Um, you know, for me, I love having white noise because I'm really sensitive sleeper. So I even use earplugs, um, because I know my husband is kind of the sheriff in our house. So he's, he's always listening. So I'm okay with that. So white noise and earplugs work for me. Um, and then, you know, just really not eating, you know, um, three hours before bed. That's huge for me. I don't love eating, you know, really late at night, but if I do, I tend to kind of stay up because I know that it's going to affect my sleep. Um, you know, one thing that's been working for my husband that I've shared with my community that they're um, getting good feedback on is um, Charlotte's Web is a CBD company out there and they've got some sleep gummies um, that really work well. And I've tried those. I tried it a few times because I'm kind of a wuss when it comes to CBD and any kind of, you know, medication, things like that. Um, and I actually had to go to the West Coast to move my daughter back home a few weeks ago. And my sleep was messed up and I took one of those and oh my gosh, it was heaven. Um, You know, so, you know, everybody kind of has their thing that works for them, but I'm a big fan of CBD on so many levels, Um, you know, anxiety and sleep and just, um, you know, my pet, we give it to our pet who's a uh, anxious little traveler. So it works for her, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm very blessed to say that sleep has never been a real problem for me. And let's talk a little bit about hormones, because I know you really specialize in kind of correcting people's hormones. So if someone came to you, what would be your first step? So what would be like the first, what would be some of the tests that you would take to check their hormones? What would be the top things? And what do you see are some of the natural fixes that you've helped people with? Well, really where I start is I do a pretty in-depth health history. And so before we even talk about testing, I'm going to go through kind of some of the lifestyle things because I I know from personal experience, food sensitivities and stress are two huge things that will negatively impact hormones that you can test all you want and we can, you know, see where your estrogen levels are and where your cortisol is. But if we don't have a plan in place to start making shifts around those things, then we're kind of wasting our time a little bit. Um, because, you know, when cortisol is raised, when we're stressed all the time, the body is in fight or flight and it's trying to protect us. And so it's kind of forgetting about hormones for a minute. So it's why, you know, I had, I remember when we were kind of in the baby years, I had several friends, had two friends that were trying to get pregnant. They were going through all of the like really stressful kind of processes to get pregnant and both of them at different times and different ages stages kind of threw in the towel it wasn't working they they kind of tapped out of you know finances and started the adoption process and as soon as they started the adoption process they both got pregnant and I have to I mean just speaking non-medically like to me that says you know they were in fight or flight they were stressed beyond belief and when they finally said you know what I'm not trying to get pregnant now we're letting go of that and, you know, we're going to adopt and the stress hormones came down that their body went back to its natural process of fertility. Cause that's, we always, our bodies want to get pregnant every month, right. As we're cycling. Um, and so it went back to that natural process and they were able to conceive. And so, you know, if, if, if our body is kind of put everything on hold and said, you know what, she's in danger. I got to keep her alive right now it's going to kind of ignore everything else. It's just like immunity right now. It's on the radar. It's like, well, if our, if our body is over here taking care of food sensitivities and, you know, stress and all of the other things, our immune system is compromised because it's trying to take, keep us alive in other places. Right. Um, so really I focus there. That's a, that's a big part of it. And we try, I try to kind of Um, peel back some layers of what's going on underneath that. Um, And sometimes it's just life. Sometimes it's just not having um, a way to manage the stress, you know? 
Um, and so it, it, it's multifaceted at the same time. We'll either, I'll either look at um, previous lab work. A lot of clients will have labs that they'll bring to me. Um, and then sometimes we'll go down um, a path of some functional testing, like a Dutch hormone test. Um, maybe we'll, you know, do some thyroid testing because a lot of doctors don't want to do comprehensive thyroid panels. They'll just do kind of the basics. Um, so it really kind of depends on where, where they are, where they are perimenopausal causal wise, um, or if they're menopausal. So there's a lot of factors. Um, so there's no real, you know, kind of starting point for everyone. Hey guys, one of the things that will take your weight loss to the next level is coaching. You can either work one-on-one with me or one of our certified private coaches. If you'd like, you can schedule your free call. It's a 10 minute strategy call just to see if coaching is gonna really take you to the next level. Don't just take my word for it. Listen to this recent review, a happy coaching client sent in. Thanks so much for your help and guidance. I never could have done it without you. The other thing is listening to the audiobook. Listening to the audiobook and getting the video course that I've done, people are seeing dramatic results. If you just listen to the audiobook 30 minutes a day, over and over and over again, and get the video course, go to ChantelRayway.com and check out the video course. You won't be sorry you did. Yeah, I love that. Anything else that you feel like has been kind of a game changer for you as far as kind of taking your health to the next level? Yeah, you know, it, it, for me, it's been educating myself and really understanding what's help, what's happening in my body. Um, you know, for I, I think we all kind of get into this at different points of our life, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's our health or maybe something else is we, we kind of give our power over to somebody else and say, fix this for me, you know, like do this for me. And for me, the biggest shift I saw was when I started researching and reading and really understanding what my body is doing on the inside. Um, so it's like, if, you know, I want to lose weight or I want to age healthy or whatever it might be, it's like, let me find out, let me really understand what's happening in my body and what I have control over. Versus going to the doctor and saying, you know, X, Y, Z is happening. What can you give me to fix it? And when I kind of made that shift in my head of we really have so much control over how we age and the state of our health, that was a huge game changer for me. And I think I've just become a nerd and that's just what I love to do. It's like the more I learn, the more I want to learn. Um, And so whether it's books or podcasts or doing things like this and learning from other people, um, it's just something I can't get enough of because I, I do, it is amazing to me. And part B of that is I've been able to help people shift their health. And so that's a pretty, you know, amazing feeling to, for somebody to say to me, okay, you've not only helped me, but subsequently now I can go help my family be healthy and live healthy and um, possibly change our, our life. Um, so really just kind of taking ownership and really learning as much as I can has been huge. Yeah, I. Um, it's funny because one of my my best friends, uh, her husband, s- said that uh, her husband was like her, his hair was falling out in clumps, and he went to the doctor, and she just took his TSH, and then said, you know, his TSH was fine, and said your hormone is fine, and you know, people don't realize. I feel like. Thyroid issues are coming up more and more and more. And I feel like people are going to the doctor. They're not getting the right answers. And um, if you guys go to ChantelRayway.com slash blood work, I kind of list what I think. Obviously, I'm not a doctor, but after seeing hundreds of thyroid specialists, like how I feel the best, I put my lab ranges and my opt what the lab ranges are, but what I believe the optimal ranges are for me, for me to feel good um, on there. But I'd like for you to talk about what thyroid issues, have you had any thyroid issues or do you see a lot of patients who deal with thyroid of what you're seeing is going on with a majority of people? Oh gosh. Yeah. We could talk about this all day probably. Yeah. So thyroid has been, thyroid disease has been a thing in my family. My mom, both my sisters were on thyroid medication and I'm the one on the beach 
wrapped in a towel. Like it's 90 degrees outside and I literally have chill bumps on my arms. It's like, you know, the, the thinning hair, like I was the classic thyroid issue person. And a few years, you know, 10 years ago, it kind of bugged me that, you know, they were taking all of my levels and nothing was coming back because if, then I wanted to pin it on something. Like I wanted to say, this is why weight is an issue. This is why sleep is an issue. And then when I realized not only, you know, could those, um, you know, levels not show up as a problem for possibly 10 years because it takes a while for that to happen. But really a lot of it was in my control to sort of help shift. And so I, I let go of being mad at the doctor and wanting my number to show up as, as an issue. And really until I saw an integrative specialist out in Seattle two years ago, did, did we identify that there was a real issue because we went deeper than the TSH. We went deeper than the basic um, numbers. And, you know, you can have thyroid um, levels that are adequate, but it doesn't mean your, your body is adequately using um, those hormones. You know, they're not, your body may not be using those hormones the way they're supposed to be. And so I've, I've worked with so many people that come to me and say, you know, I'm tired all the time you know, I don't go to the bathroom, you know, all the classic symptoms. And again, we go back to lifestyle, but I also ask them here, um, take this to your doctor. I want this. We need this comprehensive thyroid panel and we tell them exactly why. And I found over time, and I don't know if you find this as well, that when I send my clients equipped to their doctor, because they want to get it paid for with you know, insurance as a first try. Um, I, I would say it's probably 50-50 that the doctors will um, will run a full thyroid panel if we give them the reasons why. Um, I, I agree with that. I would say I've seen more like around here, it seems like only like 35 to 40% of the doctors will do it. Like you could go to that page, ChantelRayway.com slash bloodwork, see the full panel, have your doctor do it. But if you think about it, a lot of times you're paying $40 to go to get that panel done anyway. And then you could go on there and I have a lab that'll do it without even having to go to the doctor. You can just go to like the lab core and you know, the, the, it ranges anywhere from 150 to 220 or whatever it is. And sometimes like for me, it's like, yeah, I can go pay $40 copay and go to the doctor and fight it out with him. Or I can just <laughs> pay, a little, That's a good point. Extra, That's, just pay yeah. a little bit extra and just get it done myself and yeah. be done with it, you know, and then see what those ranges are. But yeah, I mean, if you are kind of strapped for money and just say, okay, go to the doctor and say, listen, this is what I heard I need to take. And can you run these labs for me and just smile real sweet, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, exactly. they always do the TSH. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we usually do that. And a lot of times those clients are going back to the doctor potentially for other reasons, whether it's checkups or different, you know, issues or whatever it might be. But, yeah, that's a really good point. I need to kind of remember that as well. But, um, but yeah, I mean, until, and you know, I wouldn't say it's hard to know for me personally, like how much of my thyroid was an issue for me and how much was stress and just imbalanced, um, you know, sex hormones, um, you know, because over time I lived a big part of my life under a lot of stress. And I think that was what, you know, kind of was the whammy for me as I was aging is my body was compensating, compensating for all the stress and everything that I was putting it through. And there comes a time where your body just says, you know what, time out, girl, you haven't done taking care of you. Like I'm exhausted. And honestly, looking back, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that that didn't turn out in some way of autoimmunity or other chronic disease, because the way that I kind of treated my body for a long time, um, it's a miracle that, you know, I'm not facing that, but it was just probably three or four years of some pretty, um, you know, gnarly hormone issues that I've slowly started, you know, uh, resolving. So, Hey guys, I wanted to tell you I'm offering a free weight loss virtual Bible study. Now is the perfect time to focus on understanding true hunger and fullness and learn what the Bible has to say about it. 
All you have to do is go to ChantelRayway.com slash Bible study. After you sign up, you'll receive a six week Bible study video that you can watch on your own, or you can get a small group of people and do it together. That's ChantelRayway.com slash Bible study for your free six week Bible study course. All right. Well, I have a question that someone asked us, Sarah in Columbus, Georgia. Chantal, I love your podcast and listen to them every day while I'm walking my dogs, which is a really good tip to be getting out there and doing like, if you're walking anyway, might as well be listening to a podcast and, you know, stimulating your mind and your body physically. She said, you and your guests frequently mention how bad birth control is due to the synthetic hormones. I would like to stop taking the pill, but need to know what other effective and safe birth control methods would be first. Is the copper IUD the way to go? Sarah in Columbus, Columbus, Georgia. Hey, Sarah. So I'll give you my kind of take on birth control. And this is literally, I haven't been on birth control in a lot of years. Um, but I do have a 23 year old daughter and I have a 19 year old daughter. And my 23 year old has kind of a super sensitive body that I had. I went off of birth control and had got pregnant with my first child a year after I got married because I was sitting on the end of the bed on Christmas Eve crying. And I was like, I looked at my husband, I said, I'm the happiest I've ever been, but why do I feel like a crazy person? And so I went off birth control and within nine months I was pregnant. Um, so anyway, I haven't, I don't have a lot of personal experience, but I'll tell you what the research that I've done along with my daughter has been, you know, when you go on a synthetic birth control, it, it takes over your body doing what it naturally does um, in its normal cycle. So we cycle with the moon naturally, um, you know, ancestrally. That's why, you know, women came together certain times of the month because they were all bleeding. And, um, you know, it, it's just kind of the way we evolved as humans. But when we stepped in and started um, kind of taking over that process, these these synthetic hormones kind of stop that brain and body connection. And so, you know, that's one thing that I, I told my younger daughter, cause she has some PMS and she's like, I want to go on birth control. And I'm like, okay, but I just want to plant the seed of, you know, when you're ready to have a baby and you go off of the birth control, you've got to take some time and help reconnect your body talking to itself, your brain and your, your sex hormones talking to each other because they disconnect, you know? Um, and so that's the thing that worries me with her going on birth control at a young age, because I feel like if she were a little older, maybe her body has had that time to sort of go through multiple cycles and kind of understand what it's supposed to do. Um, and so with my younger daughter, she was very much like me. She was emotional roller coaster every month. It just, it wasn't the, the right route for her. Um, she was involved in a relationship. She was sexually active. And so obviously that was a concern. Um, she tried the copper IUD and within two months of having that in, it, it just made her a mess. Um, and she's, it's probably taken her about four or five months, um, to kind of regulate her period and kind of get over some of the, um, residual side effects that she had from that. Now that's not to say that's the case for everyone. Um, but I really, I guess what I would say is really do your research um, and, you know, I know the doctor that she went back to, to, to take out the copper IUD, IUD really shamed her and told her that if she was going to do a natural planning technique, that it was irresponsible and really berated her for it, which really upset me. But, um, her process now, she uses a um, device called the Daisy. I think it's, is that right? Daisy. Um, and it basically, you take your, you take your, um, temperature and every morning and you kind of, it's kind of a natural planning. Um, you know, she will probably be engaged in the next year or so. And so if, you know, for her, a pregnancy, would it be, um, a terrible thing? Uh, not ideal, obviously, but I know there are people out there that, you know, you're not always wanting to have children. And so I think you just have to kind of make that decision, you know, it's a very personal decision. And I think there's a lot of really smart doctors out there that can really guide you through um, kind of making those decisions and really knowing sort of what the physical implications are of um, 
you know, the birth control pill and an IUD. Yeah, I agree with you. I would say the only thing that I personally would do would be the calendar method, which the calendar method works by abstaining sex in the fertile window, which is basically calculated by the average cycle length and predicting when you're the most fertile. And yeah, you're right. There's an app called Daisy. It's D-A-Y-S-Y. And it's basically your own personal fertility tracker. And it lets you know when you're, it just records your own menstrual cycle and um, yeah, by looking at your temperature and it can calculate your fertile window. Um, I think it's, you know, to me, that's really the only, the best option. Obviously you have the condom, right? It's an oldie, but, yeah. goodie, but you could <laughs> use the good old condom method, but I've heard negative things as well about the, co- the copper IUD. I just don't, I don't know enough about it, but what I have heard, uh, I haven't heard good things about it. So I'd be very skeptical on that. Have you heard anything else besides the calendar method or using like a Daisy app or anything like that? That is a good, so is that what your daughter did? She just did the the Daisy and the Mm -hmm. calendar method? Yeah. And I will say that, you know, people will say, and especially after coming off of the copper IED, her cycle was really erratic and people will say, well, I'm erratic. Like I can't count on this being right. Well, what by taking your temperature, it tracks you over a number of months. So you don't want to start that and then immediately think you're safe. You need to track it for several months and see, make sure that your cycle is pretty, um, um, gets a little bit regular. Although I guess it's based on your temperature, right? So your temperature raises when you ovulate. And, um, but what was my point? Um, there are some other methods out there. Nothing that she was, you know, really thinking was a good resolution for her. Um, and I will say th- there are doctors out there that are that will listen and help you make decisions. That was not her experience where we are. And, and we've seen some pretty... Um, phenomenal practitioners. They just weren't um, obstetricians, gynecologists that were open-minded to other things. So um, just really do your research and, 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 and make that decision, I think. Yeah. And, you know, what they say is that your basal body temperature is, if you say, let's say it was 97 to 97 degrees before ovulation, and then maybe your basal body temperature increased from like 97.6 to 98.6 on the days after ovulation. And so that increase in temperature lasts several days and that's called your luteal phase. And so your most, your most fertile days are two to three days before your basal body temperature rises. So, you know, I, I think there's so many things that tracking your temperature can do. One of the things is checking your thyroid. So Mm -hmm. I I need to do a whole episode just on that, on how you can check your temperature to see if your thyroid is functioning. Mm. Yeah, that would be awesome. Well, and, and not only that, are you tapping into kind of what your fertility is doing, but I think long-term, you know, your body, like it really helps you trust and just sort of really understand what's going on in your body, you know, because I think we can become very disconnected um, from our bodies. And over time, as you know, especially as you age and some of those perimenopausal symptoms start to kick in, it it can become one of those things where you feel like your body is sort of betraying you instead of kind of going inward and like honoring sort of all the things that your body does for you. Um, I don't know, I think there's something really valuable to, tracking your cycle and really understanding and kind of honoring what's going on inside, you know? Yeah, it really is. And it does take some work because you have Mm -hmm. to remember to do it and kind of set an alarm, but it does put you really in touch with your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My daughter puts hers right by her bedside. So as soon as she wakes up in the morning, she just grabs it off the bed and does it and it tracks it on her phone. So it's not, it's not a huge big deal. It's, it's like anything that you get into a habit with. Yes. And intermittent fasting 
helps your cycle to regulate. My cycle never was regulated before I started doing intermittent fasting. And once I did, I'm very, very regular. I'm now a couple days here or there, but for the most part, very regular. Yeah, it's great. Well, Missy, this has been great. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. So Missy Bain, um, Missy.Bain on Instagram, um, Missy Bain FDNP on um, Twitter. Um, my new program is called the Flexible Eating Lifestyle that will be launching in a few weeks. You can find me there. So everywhere, Flexible Eating Lifestyle or Missy Bain. Awesome. Well, this is great. Thank you guys so much for being with us and stay tuned. We have another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now. This has been a Sempronto Media Production.